like to thank you all for joining us today. And today we have a very special guest. We have Pete Lyons, author of many um, fascinating and uh, visually stunning uh, motorsports books. Pete, thank you so much for joining us today. Alan, this is going to be a delight. I'm enjoying talking about all this. Well, outstanding. There's some great stories to tell. There's some great uh, pictures to uh, to show. And um, to lead off, why don't you tell us uh, how you came to be um, a uh, to to produce these books? Uh, you know, they're filled with great photos. They're great stories. Um, tell you. us, give us a little bit of your background. Um, I couldn't find anything that uh, I wanted to do more than what I'm doing right now. I uh, I. I grew up in New York State. My dad was a photographer and an engineer. He worked for the General Electric Company, but in the weekends he would go off to car races and photograph them. So when I was quite young, he started tag, letting me tag along and he put a camera in my hand and say, go shoot that. And uh, he taught me how to pan and uh, it, it, you know, to keep the car, the moving car frozen in the frame while the scenery blurs. And he thought I was pretty good at that. And from there, I thought, you know, this is fun. I really like this. And he was writing for Auto Sport Magazine, an English publication. He was their American photographer, only as a weekend gig. And uh, I eventually took over from him, and I became their North American guy. And I went all around. And then finally, they moved me to Europe. And I did Formula One in Europe for six, or, sorry, four years. And so I, I've covered a lot of the world and a lot of different kind of racing series, Formula One, Can-Am, IndyCar. Uh, I did a few NASCAR races. I've done a drag race or two. Uh, I then also worked for Auto Week, similarly at doing the same kinds of things for many years. I've uh, had stories published in Car and Driver, Road and Track. Uh, those are the big ones. Vintage Motorsport is my current, uh, current outlet. I do a column called Fast Lines in Vintage Motorsport right now. And so, so and it's... But then the so books you did, have kind of grown out of that. You didn't just happen upon these photos. You took these photos. <laughs> uh, not all of the photos that you see in these books, no. But I shot a lot of them, yes. I've, I've got Outstanding. mountains. As you and I were talking before the show began, I've got too many photographs to deal with. <laughs> yeah, it was one of those situations where you're trying to find a specific photograph, and you just have too many to find one, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. Right, right. Well, tell us about your latest book. You've you've got quite a few of them. I'm going to show that here. There's, uh, oh, you, you know, all all kinds of uh, books. Uh, something you can oh, yeah. find on just about any topic you're you're interested in. Um, yes. You know, the Riverside International Raceway, quite a, a storied uh, storied racetrack. A lot of different kinds of racing took place there. Um, uh, Lotus specific, uh, Can Am specific, and even uh, uh, Make and Mark specific. Um, and uh, your latest one is about the uh, the Shadow Racing team. Now That's this correct. is a, a legendary team that uh, I think most people know them for their fairly outrageous Can Am cars, but that wasn't the total story. They were involved in several different kinds of racing. Yes, uh, it was the creation of a very mysterious fellow named Don Nichols. Uh, we can tell a little bit more about him later on, but uh, he he uh, left the military after a long career in the U.S. Army. Uh, I should preface that by saying that he was a farm boy from Missouri, and he joined the U.S. Army before he was old enough. And, and he was underage when he signed up for the U.S. Army in World War Three. <laughs> World War Three. Not yet. Not not quite he, yet. He 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 signed up uh, for the army while he was underage for World War II in 1943, and he jumped at Normandy in D-Day as a paratrooper. He was one of the first in before dawn. He was a pathfinder paratrooper, which meant he landed on enemy territory uh, before most of most of the Allies landed. And his job was to set up signaling devices so that the oncoming waves of uh, cargo planes or troop transports could drop their uh, gliders and their paratroopers at the right place. And so he he, bat he was wounded immediately on that day, and then he was wounded at the Battle of the Bulge in Belgium. And then he uh, stayed in the military in the Far East, and he had a kind of an interestingly mysterious past uh, there in the Far East where he was... Uh, 
thought to be a spy for the CIA, and it's something that he liked to cultivate as a mysterious, mysterious uh, uh, image about himself. So he would never say yes or no, but he would let you think that, well, there must be something to it because he's not denying it. So I don't know the so, answer. So whatever the story was, he was like, well, you know, maybe, yeah. <laughs> something like that, yes. Yeah, well, but there I, was... I there was there was certainly something, but some cachet behind it. It it right. was all entirely plausible. He wasn't right. just. Uh, this is certainly not a case of stolen valor. Uh, he, Don Nichols he, was a, a a certified, shall I use the term, badass. <laughs> he, he yes yes there there are things that prob he always said that he wanted to do a book about his military experiences and he never did it, but he also said that he wanted to do a book about his racing experiences and that's. He never did it himself, but late in life, just be, you know, a few years before he died, which is a few years ago now, he finally agreed that uh, I could come and sit with him for several days. So my wife and I went up there, and he opened his archive to us up in Salinas. He had what I oh, call the boy. wizard's lair. Where it was an old steel warehouse, just piled the rafters with everything. He was a pack rat. He would not discard anything and it was a, a major effort to get him to sell anything although people began to do it yes that's myself talking with don uh at, at that time i was doing the book back in the nine in 2013 2014 era and uh he, he if you notice he uh, he turned up with a, a you know a blazer with the shadow emblem on it he, with a french beret on himself and he was uh, quite a uh, he was quite the showman and quite the promoter, from what I understand. He was. He, he was, exactly, yes. That was one of the things about the Shadow team, when they, particularly when they went to Europe. They opened eyes by the quality of their presentation. They had a, uh, you know, they had uh, press hospitality and sponsor hospitality before that Europeans really had caught on to how to do that. So they are still remembered for Don's uh, ability to, uh, you know, make a splash. Uh, it's unfortunately the cars didn't live up to that. The cars were sniffing on the edge of, of being successful, but they never quite got there. They did win two different Formula One races, including a world championship Formula One race right toward the end of their, their run. But uh, that's as high as they got in Formula One. But now, however, uh, you just you ahead. just mentioned that that the uh, the shadow team participated in Formula One. Like I said, most people remember them for their Can Am cars, but of that course, wasn't right. the uh, the uh, the extent of their racing. What what no. forms of racing were they involved in? Well, if you talk to the Europeans, they are so Formula One centric. That's all they know about. So <laughs> they they heard vaguely that there were Can Am cars as well, but they're not interested in those. I mean, right. There are many. There are many. There are. Sorry, my friends in England and Europe. There, you, you, you are interested too. Um, Don Nichols came back from Japan, having after his military life, he uh, opened a business in Japan where he was importing automotive parts and particularly racing parts and racing tires for the Japanese industry, which in Cold War uh, uh, Japan, you know, in the fifties they were desperately trying to rebuild and trying to modernize their country. And so Don Nichols was a go-between getting them technologies and parts that, and know-how that they didn't uh, have at the time. And so he obviously set his own prices for these things and he came back with quite a lot of money. And then he liked, he, he had been interested in building a car. He'd, he built a car with, with a Bill Strop, uh, the off-road racer uh, that he was also involved in the Lincoln program for the uh, Mexican road race and also the mobile mm -hmm. economy run. And Don Nichols was involved with Bill Strop doing that. And they built a car in Japan for racing in Japan, but I don't think it was ever unveiled or raced, but we do have a photograph of it in the book. Uh, this came from Don's own uh, archive and his, his, his daughter Penny's archive. Um, but when he came back to California, he hooked up with a guy named Trevor Harris, who was one of the most brilliant geniuses in car design, uh, a real mad scientist. Trevor is a wonderful guy, and he helped enormously with this book. And he and uh, Don Nichols built this uh, tiny tire car. They got Firestone to help them develop a tiny tire car with 10-inch uh, diameter wheels on the front and only 12 on the back. And they were, okay. that compares to the 15 inches front and rear that most cars had. And it and doesn't I believe sound this like is much it. in inches. That's, I believe that's, that's it, it right there. Yeah. 
That's right. Yep. That is uh, Fearless Fulmer, George Fulmer, driving it at Mossport. That's one of my pictures. Uh, d during the car's debut in 1970, June of 1970. And uh, you can see how he towers in the car compared to the little tiny tires, which, of course, were done for a low profile, a low body line to improve straight line speed, which it did. That car was the fastest car on the straight at Mossport. This this is the hairpin turn at the beginning of the straight down at the bottom of the circuit. It's the, the one that they call Moss hairpin after Sterling Moss. But that's followed by upwards of a mile of climbing straight away. And going up that rise, the shadow was in the 190 range. And the McLarens oh and so on were under 180. So it, it now, was... This yes. is basically, they designed basically a go-kart with a monstrous <laughs> engine and a huge <laughs> yes, wing in it. I know, <laughs> the go-kart the go on steroids, people were calling it, or, or somebody else called it a skateboard with a Chevy strapped on top. But then, of course, the problem is you, you come to the end of the straight, and you need to, the car to do other things than go fast. You needed to stop. That was a problem. You needed to go around the corner. That was a problem. So it wasn't really an, uh, a, a successful car, but it made the shadow name, I think. If they had come up with a completely conventional car, and I don't think people today would know the word shadow. Uh, right. Because they, they, you know, they're, they're not involved anymore at all. I mean, there's no such thing as a shadow car anymore. So it would have just sunk into history if it was an ordinary car. But the fact that it was so extraordinary looking the uh i think it i think it, it created an image in people's minds of, oh i want to know more about this crazy thing called a shadow and then now as time went most on, of this oh go ahead i was just going to say is over succeeding seasons they went away from the experimental thing and season by season they became more conventional but uh and similarly at at, kind of, at the same time they became more successful they got faster and faster and were you know, leading races occasionally until finally in 1974 they won the championship in can am this now, is most the, of us... go ahead i'm sorry i did, this is the uh, as they were rolling the car out into the pit lane at most sport for a practice day uh that's don nichols in the center at the with the wing you can't see his face very well but he's he's helping to push the car and the guy to our left on the outside of the wing looking forward is uh, Trevor Harris. He's the designer. And the, uh, the Japanese guy driving the car is one of the mechanics. It's called Teji. He's one of Don's friends that he made in Japan. He came over to work in the K&M car. And I don't now, have the idea of the other guy. Now, this, is, uh, this was kind of a mango orange car, uh, kind of uh, sort of close to the McLarens. Yes. But most of us know um, shadow cars for a completely different livery. That's um, right. Which that's is, right. Which is something that, uh, again, speaks to the showmanship. What What is that livery, and how did that come about? It's jet black, and uh, it's glossy black. And the next the next car uh, started out uh, black. Uh, we don't. Uh, we've got lots and lots of pictures. I don't know if you've got. Yeah. Okay. That's the championship car, and you see it's completely black. That's the uh, that's the that's actually the winning championship car that Jackie Oliver drove. That this is a shot I took many years later, back in like 2013, 2014 at uh, Monterey, but this car was on display there. But that's the uh, that's how people now in this country remember the shadow image, and as you can see, it is a slinky, svelte, beautiful car. It was designed by an English guy named Tony Southgate. Uh, the basic chassis was built in England where they had a shadow had a Formula One operation, but then the car was finished here in the States and developed in the States. And it won all it won the first four races of 1974 against, let's let's be honest, minimal opposition. But they did. That's not their fault that they came and nobody else was ready. They they did a really good job. They beat Formula everybody that partner. showed up. <laughs> they beat everyone that showed they beat everyone that showed up <laughs> yes exactly right exactly right so and the, that's one of the iconically beautiful cars the dn4 now it was in uh, all black and had uop uh, 101 lead free on it um yes. what what is the story behind that uh uop still exists uh it is a company based in chicago and it is a worldwide mega mega company in petrochemicals 
And the only reason you and I know the name is because for five seasons, they sponsored these race cars. Before that and after that, they were not involved in racing at all. They don't care whether you, the public, knows about them because you're not their customer. Uh, they sell to oil refineries, oil companies. They deal with uh, people who are developing fuels. And remember, petroleum also has many, many other spinoffs, including plastics and medicines and, and kerosene and so on. So uh, the uh, UAP didn't need the public to know who they were because they build catalytic converters. Uh, I'm sorry, catalytic converters. Uh, cracking towers around the world. They build, build them everywhere. There's oil industry. You see uh, gigantic machine, gigantic installations. UOP is involved in designing and building those. So if, if you're in the Arab oil business or the Southeast Asia oil business or wherever, you, you, you deal with UOP, but you and I wouldn't deal with UOP. But for a short time, they gave Can-Am and motor racing one of the most uh, iconic liveries uh, to, yes. to, to this day. And uh, the team themselves, from what I understand, would dress in all black as well. Uh, they, they had, yes, that's correct. Uh, the, uh, you know, they, it was part of the Don Nichols idea of making a cohesive team. They weren't the only ones, uh, you know, Penske certainly came into it and, but after Don Nichols started uh, and so on, the, uh, I, I, we're talking about the black cars after UOP ended its relationship, the, the cars began to change color as they found different sponsors. So you will find white cars, blue cars, uh, a few more black cars, red and white cars. Um, there was a car that was painted that uh, there's a Dutch, a tobacco company with it, and the emblem is a lion and I don't have a picture of it for you here today but the uh, the, the the lion head livery on one of the formula 1 cars dry mind is the one of the all-time spectacular formula 1 liveries well and it it just uh, it the black cars and that that uh, you know that slinky slick look and Don Nichols uh, uh, penchant for uh, self promotion all added yes. up to uh, something you know they were a totally unique set of cars totally unique individuals totally unique look something that made a splash even though they weren't necessarily the most successful car. <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, the thing about motor racing is that you know that they're all working the hardest they can. They've got the best people they can afford to get. And there's always the chance that this next race, they're going to have made the breakthrough. They're going to solve their niggling little problems. This is George Fulmer testing the car before it became short-tailed. This is at Riverside in 1969. Uh, and it shows the original configuration of the car as Trevor Harris intended it to be. And you can see now it begins to actually make sense as a low drag machine because the tiny tires allowed a, like a 24 inch high uh, uh, body line. Literally, it was knee high. If you stood next to it, your kneecap was even with the top of the front fender. And, but it also had a long tail in the, with the radiators in the back. And it was a bullet on the straight. Right. Now, uh, you, we had indicated that uh, Shadow Racing was also involved in Formula One. Indeed. They, uh, in 1973, they branched out and added a Formula One team. This is uh, Tom Price in one of the Shadows at uh, Monte Carlo. Uh, this is heading down the hill uh, after, out of the casino hairpin. Uh, it's not a hairpin, excuse me. It's this casino turn. There are other hairpins at Monaco. But they raced at Monaco. They raced at, they, George Fulmer, uh, two years before this, 73, in their first year, Fulmer, their very first race was Kailami in South Africa. And I had seen them racing in the States. And then I saw them make their debut in, uh, in South Africa, where George Fulmer had never raced in Africa before. He'd never seen the racetrack. He had never driven a Formula One car. He started the race well in the back, but he kept the thing going, soldiering through. And at the end of the day, he took a point for sixth place. He won a championship point in his very first debut race. And I think people ought to remember that about George Fulmer. And then three, uh, the very next weekend in Spain, in, in Barcelona, in the streets of Barcelona, he finished third. And that was a oh, fighting wow. third. He was he was spent a lot of the race racing with one of the Tyrrells, uh, Francois Severus Tyrrell. 
and uh, he he uh, gave him a hard time. This is the uh, a later car. It's, it's under restoration. Uh, Don Nichols owned this car and was having it restored to, for auction. But this I shot this in the shop where it was being done, and it's the DN8, and it's the car design that uh, Alan and Jones won their single Formula One Grand Prix race in Austria in 1977, and it's uh, it's a it's, it's, it's the same basic configuration of car, but it's refined. It's got that sleek uh, arrow shape. The, the pods at the back, either side of the engine, holds, house the radiators. The uh, radiators are mounted fore and aft so that the air comes in from the outside and blows in toward the engine and exhausts out the back. Absolutely amazing. Uh, visually stunning cars, uh, you know, great story behind the team. Um, and just uh, one, of, one of the icons of motor racing. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. This is the same. Uh, this is Tom Price in the DN5. This is Monaco 75. That's the, the uh, uh, one of the turns down below uh, the hairpin. I'm, I can't say hairpin, excuse me. Uh, anyway, it's called Mirabeau. Uh, this is, and it was a wonderful shot. You could be up high on a wall looking over the brink and looking down on this turn. So everybody likes to shoot there. But uh, this shows when the cars still had the UOP sponsorship, but it was their last year. And people were starting to say, you know, the cars are all black. They're kind of hard to see and hard, hard to photograph. They're not showing up on TV very well. And so they came up with these, uh, what they called re-entry colors. And they, the, apparently the, the story is that it was uh, inspired by the colors that a spacecraft or a space capsule makes as it re-enters the Earth's atmosphere. It's, you know, glows white hot at the front and trails off to more of an orange later down, uh, you know, further down the body side. Whether that's a true story or not, I don't know, but it's part of the shadow lore. <laughs> well, it's it makes makes for good uh, a good story to, to tell. And, right. uh, yeah, right. which is, uh, you know, 99 percent of, uh, of promotion. And uh, that was certainly certainly something that the uh, the shadow team did well. Now, sorry about my hat here. Oh, no worries. <laughs> now, uh, some of your other books uh, branch out and expand on that a little bit. Uh, you know, yes. you have a book about Can-Am. Um, and yes. there were some other very successful teams in Can-Am. Um, yes. And we're showing one right here. Uh, matter of fact, uh, tell us tell us about, uh, about uh, these cars and uh, what they meant to Can-Am. These are the Porsche cars. And again, George Fulmer is in this picture. Uh, this, these are the turbocharged Porsches of 1972. It's the Porsche 917 slash 10K, to give it its nomenclature. The, the Porsche had built uh, uh, streamlined Le Mans cars, coupe bodies with long tails. And then they decided they wanted to build a Can-Am car. And so they made it a spider version with an open cockpit and a short tail with a gigantic wing on it. But the real technological thing here was the development of turbocharging. If you remember back in the early 70s, uh, turbocharging was around. People were turbocharging it. Indy cars were running turbos. But it did not work well for road racing. It was too much throttle lag. And Porsche and Mark Donahue, who was Penske's driver slash engineer, they worked and they solved that problem. And this is the first successful turbocharged road racing car, and it just destroyed the McLarens. It, it won out of that season. They had, I think, 10 races and they won uh, eight of them. So it was uh, it kind of. Uh, you know the dominant force in a in a, uh, a yes. series that was right. uh, you know completely over the top. Uh, yes, right. while the, while the uh, the shadow cars were over yes. the top in their their looks and their presentation, the Porsche cars right. were over the top in their performance. Oh, absolutely! This uh, that started out with the uh, a five liter engine turbocharged to about eight hundred and fifty horsepower, and by the end of the season and in the next year. They had gone to 5.4 liters and more boost. And then typically they raced at what they claimed was 1,100 horsepower, but their driver had a mob where he could go up to as much as 1,500 horsepower, which they didn't need to do because that was many hundreds of horsepower over the best that the big block Chevys and the McLarens could do. 
but I I took this picture to show Woody here. Woody uh, Woodward, uh, one of their Penske mechanics, uh, they're ready to change this engine. Just what a monster that engine is! It's it 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 just is a, a huge lump of horsepower, and the the uh, it's a flat twelve. You know, six cylinders out each side. The, the picture, the uh, this is George Fulmer driving the car at Watkins Glen. Uh, that's Woody at the lower left there. Uh, Roger Penske himself is leaning over the cockpit talking to the driver. Uh, and you can see the tur turbo uh, logs at the top of the engine uh, leading away from the turbos themselves, which are mounted here at the tail of the car. And you can see the two exhaust pipes sticking out the back. Now, for anybody that hasn't ever been close to one of these cars, uh, pictures do not do these cars justice. Um, they're, they are extraordinarily small with extraordinarily huge tires and a monster engine in them. Uh, I remember the first time I saw a 917 Porsche, you know, they, they look pretty big and boy, they yes. aren't. They are very, very small cars. It is. Uh, if you see photographs, uh, it, you, typically there was an American car, a, a Detroit car of some sort, pacing these cars. And the photographs show that the big monster Chevy or Ford or whatever it is leading the, uh, even a Camaro leading the, the pack, you know, the, they dwar it dwarfs the cars behind. And yet the, the cars behind are just cruising. They're wishing they could go faster on the warm-up lap. But the, the pace car is heeling over, its tires are howling, Sterling Moss is driving it, it it's, you know, he's doing it the best he can to give them a pace. Yeah, and and they're... Is, uh, the, they are, I just, I like the, the view of this, the, the angle of the car, it shows the cantilevered rear wing sticking out. Monster, the monster rear wing. And I think, uh, at least for for folks of a, of a certain age, um, uh, that I fall into um, their first exposure to these cars because you know Can Am wasn't very widely televised. Um, at least in my household, we didn't subscribe to a whole lot of uh, of car magazines. But I was aware of these cars, and I have still in my collection both of these cars as slot cars. Um, Good, and that that's how most uh, people that I know were exposed to this and know know mm -hmm. these cars from that. Yes, yes. Yeah, just absolutely amazing cars, um, and uh, you know, uh, fantastic names that that went along with it. Uh, you know, yes. legends of the sport. Yes, this is the um, same event as this is Donnybrook, Minnesota, or what they call Brainerd now. Um, this is Mark Donny who's sitting in the car. Uh, he has just come back from a nasty accident he had. This is his first race back after he, you know, damaged his his knee and his foot. Um, he, uh, he, he, you wonder if you're looking for a steering wheel, I think that's why he's kind of smiling at me because he's actually holding the steering wheel with his left hand, uh, because that, you know, that car had a detachable steering wheel, which was not really, you know, every, not every car had that back in those days. No, no, and pretty, pretty necessary to get in and out of that car as well. <laughs> indeed, indeed, yes. Yeah. Now there was a whole nother uh, class of cars uh, in Can-Am and talking about, you know, making a splash and uh, being, uh, being unique. Um, let me pull up this picture here. And uh, again, uh, the exposure to most people uh, oh. is through, is through a slot car. And uh, boy, these were, uh, these were pretty popular. Tell us about, uh, yes. Tell us about these and uh, the 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 maker, the cars, and uh, the whole story. The car is a Chaparral. This is at Road America in 1967. The Chaparrals from Texas, done by Jim Hall and Hap Sharp, uh, were and Jim is the driver for this car. Uh, the the important thing, uh, or the probably the most famous thing about the Chaparrals in those days, is the wing. You see the wing that's, uh, we only see half of it at the top of the picture. It's mounted on two struts. And you notice the struts go right down in line with the rear wheel and they are actually mounted on the rear wheel hub carriers. The innovation here is that this downforce goes not through the chassis, uh, but straight into the tires. 
the benefit of this is if you if you mount it on the chassis like cars today have to do by regulation you have to have uh, strong suspension strings to hold the additional load in those days with this chaparral system you didn't need that the the springs could be just as subtle and soft and and rote and compliant to the road as uh, a normal car but with the addition of the uh, i'm sorry with the benefit of additional uh, downforce that uh, that that previous Oops. shot showed uh, the two of the McLarens that had copied the idea, except that they did not have the Chaparral's flipper wing. The previous shot that showed the the guy looking in the back of it is Bruce McLaren, who's the head of the McLaren team and a two-time uh. K&M winner. And he hasn't seen this car at, at the. This is the opening race of the season. So, uh, and unlike today, there was no reason why Bruce couldn't wander up and have a quiet peek in, inside of how they did all this stuff. And it was sometime after that that the McLaren came up with a similar idea on their car. Ah, uh, fancy that. Now, it, they're, uh, the Chaparral innovations uh, in, in yes. uh, Can-Am, which was kind of just wide open. It's br it, run it what was. you run, what, whatever you want to do. Um, they is. came up with some, some innovative ideas. I know. The Can-Am was a marvelous thing because it was so, the rule book was so thin. As long as it was a sports car, meaning it had two seats and, and the fenders over the wheels, pretty much anything else was uh, a fair game. You could do whatever you wanted to. This is, one, this is probably the Chaparral that did not work at all. Uh, this is the 1969 2H. The whole idea was just as Chaparral, I'm sorry, just as Shadow was doing in the same year, they were trying to go for very high speed on the straightaway. Uh, the uh, the whole idea was it was a low drag car built like a missile, but, and it had a little wing out the back. Uh, and you notice that the you can see the driver who is John Surtees, the uh, a former uh, world champion not only on cars and on motorcycles, but also he was a Can Am champion. But by 1969, he had signed to drive for Jim Hall in the Chaparral. You notice you can see a window in the door looking at his, his steering wheel and his arms. Originally, that was going to be the side window so that the driver could see out because Jim Hall's original idea was to cut drag even further by dropping the driver several inches down below the top of the body line and having it a coupe top. There would be a gigantic piece of plastic over him, but level with the body. And the idea was it would be a streamlined super coupe where you could look out over your toes and you could look out sideways with your, uh, through the window. That leaves the, the problem of actually seeing past the front wheels. It, there's a gig, if you think of a, a car with a big, thick A-pillar, there's a blind spot for you. And that, this one had a monster blind spot. So Jim Hall said, no, that's no problem. And he rigged up a, a pair of periscopes on the side so that it, it could show like trucker window, like trucker mirrors, but two of them, so he could see forward. And John Surtees came to the factory, he looked at it, he says, no, I'm not going to drive that thing. He, he demanded Wisely. that they cut a hole. In, yeah, he demanded they leave the top off and sit him up to drive it properly. He wasn't going to drive that contraption. And Jim Hall was always uh, annoyed by that. He still think, thinks that it would have been a successful car. Well, and uh, speaking of uh, innovations in Chaparral, it's uh, hard to mention the, the make ah. without mentioning this car. Right. This was the final Can-Am Chaparral, 1970. They had gone from the low drag, consequently low downforce car that did not work to the absolute opposite. This is a very, very high downforce car. Uh, you see the two fans at the back. Those are actually military surplus tank air cooling fans mounted at the back of the car to extract air from underneath the car and uh, I wish I had a pointer here, but it, it, under the sides of the body work, particularly at the back where the square back is, you can see that there are, or you could be able to see skirts. They are GE Lexan uh, plastic material hanging down and they're like a quarter inch or a half inch clear of the road and they are seals. It, it's exactly like a suction cup. The fans generated suction inside the car, which clamped the car to the road. And it, it did dramatically increase tire adhesion, just exactly like the chaparral wings had done. 
but this was applied through the suspension and it, it affected the whole car and the, the download was incredible. Now, um, I have a picture here. Let me find that. Those fans didn't run on their own. Good good point. I'm glad you raised that. I was, <laughs> I was trying to figure out how to say that without uh, making it too long. This is the, the snowmobile mobile engine, which is driving the fans. It's, it's a two-cylinder, two-stroke engine made for snowmobiles by, by Austria and a company in Austria called Hilo, J-L-O. And you can see the two exhausts sticking out to the upper left. You can imagine the racket that made. Uh, to the to the left, we can see one of the two fans. Uh, and the, uh, the, the the snowmobile engine had about 70 horsepower. And it was fuel injected and so on. And they, uh, they drove the fans with that. And it sat on top of the gearbox. And it, the engine, of course, was the main big Chevy engine, the 465 Chevy. And you can see the giant exhaust pipes for that engine. And so it, this was a two-engined Can-Am car. Uh, wow. it, uh, it's not something that you expect to see in other kinds of racing. You wouldn't expect to build a Formula One car with two engines because it's not allowed. But the Formula, but the Can-Am rules didn't prohibit it. If you want two engines, fine. There was a car that had four engines one day. It didn't work very well, but they had it. <laughs> but you got to try it. You never know. You might end up in first Exactly. Place. <laughs> exactly right. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. So now um, it, to bring up another team, actually, I think we have uh, a couple more uh, Chaparral pictures here. Right, right. Let's That's see. the first Chaparral, yes. That's the 1966 first generation Chaparral with the uh, wing. Uh, it's, the, it's the debut race. Uh, it was really fast. It was on pole. Uh, that would be uh, that's in the race that shows uh, Phil Hill, world champion driving and many time Le Mans winner driving for Chaparral. Uh, this is coming down the first turn at the old Bridgehampton racetrack. Uh, the the uh, you see the car is rounder than the uh, later generations of Chaparral, but and it has the wing in not white now, but it's it's dark blue on struts, but you can see, again, you can see the struts loaded the rear tires completely. That's Bruce McLaren and a McLaren right behind him. And that car just ran away from the McLarens. Uh, and it was uh, um, uh, it, 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 sobering to Bruce McLaren because he would, had been used to dominating uh, can -Am, I'm sorry, uh, sports car racing in North America with those little McLarens. But when he came to the can -Am, he thought it would be more of the same, but then he was amazed at how much uh, more um, competitive, competitive it was now that it had big money behind it. This is Phil Hill and the Chaparral at the same event. Absolutely amazing photos. Um, just great history, um, you know, great cars. And uh, here we see the uh, the small uh, Cox uh, um, COX. Uh, oh, yes. That's sponsorship right. uh, from, uh, you know, a, a uh, model airplane and model company, uh, which right, yes. tie, tied right into uh, putting these uh, models of these cars into hands of uh, little urchins like me, who then quickly became <laughs> uh, motorsports obsessed. <laughs> good for you. Good for Cox. Good for you. I'm glad it worked. Yes. yes. Yeah. There was there was a lot more to the chaparral too, of course. Uh, the, the 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 famous thing is everybody thought thinks it has an automatic transmission. In fact, it has a torque converter transmission. It's a clutchless transmission. The driver still changes gear with a gear lever, but he doesn't ah. have a clutch pedal. And the the fact that he doesn't have a clutch pedal frees up the left hand foot pedal uh, to be a clutch uh, i'm sorry to be a wing adjustment pedal uh the, Which, the driver uh, could the driver could flip could push down on the pedal and it would flip the wing horizontally for high speed on the straights and then he move his left foot onto the center mounted brake pedal and that would allow the wing to flip back up in its high drag high downforce configuration to go into the turn this is bruce mclaren wearing Oscar Kowaleski's helmet and Oscar was a prankster and he put a wing on his own helmet to help, help his track performance. <laughs> Speaking of adjusting the wing. <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, 
And, and it, here you can here you can see a, a normal sized car leading a, a pack of Can Am cars, like we'd mentioned earlier. Right. That's the that's the picture I was thinking of. This is the '65 race. At uh, I'm sorry, I keep saying these things wrong. Sixty seventy sixty seven Can Am Elkhart Lake season opener that year. Uh, that's Sterling Moss driving in the Camaro pace car, and it's it's a tricked up Camaro. Incidentally, I've learned later it's a show car, and it still exists. The owner has contacted me, and he wanted photographs of this car. I, I didn't know at the time. I thought to me it was a Camaro, but you know it's a trick Camaro. And Sterling Moss drove it at the pace car as a pace car at Road America, and he's going pretty darn briskly, and the Can Am car is behind him or just trundling around, wishing he'd get the heck out of their way. Uh, you see the the five rows back. We see the Chaparral, uh, who it wasn't as quick on, in this debut event as it as uh, it would be later in the season. It it was significantly quicker uh, later on in the in the series. Uh, that's Bruce and Denny at the front. That the in that yellow ochre, uh, can McLaren car. The, I'm sorry, the Tangerine. You see, I, I, feel, I wish I could write all this because I can fix it. Uh, sorry. Uh, these are, this is the, uh, the papaya color is what I'm trying to say. Gotcha. It, really, yeah. it's, the, it's the color of papaya fruit, and I can prove that. I had a papaya salad one day, and I, a, a guy who lives near us and has a, an actual paint ship of that McLaren color in his wallet at all times, you know, 50 years later, and he pulled it out, and we compared it to the color of the papaya fruit in our salad. It's the identical color. The McLarens were painted papaya, people. It's true. And anyway, uh, Denny was in, Denny Holm was in car five and Bruce McLaren drove car four. And that was the year that they just began the Bruce and Denny show dominating the Can Am. Yeah. And that's yeah. the chaparral, right? That's Jim Hall's chaparral right behind them. Yep. And uh, again, an, another uh, storied make that was, uh, you know, people associate with uh, with Can-Am is McLaren. Yes, it, it really McLaren made the Can-Am. This is uh, Peter Revson driving McLaren uh, to his championship in 1971. He is the first American driver to win the Can-Am championship. He took over from uh, uh, F Bruce McLaren was killed, and then so they needed another driver, and there's more to that story. But basically, uh, Peter Revson was their team driver in '71, and again in '72, uh, brilliant driver, taken far far too early, uh, just as Bruce was. Uh, and this is the same car, and this is this is what I would look like a few minutes later after I shot this picture. This is at Riverside before the final race of the uh, 71 season. That's Revson giving rides to people. And because it was a sports car, folks, thanks to the SCCA demanding that it look like a sports car and be presented as a sports car, it had a at least space for a passenger to sit in there. There was no seat. There were no seat belts. It was very narrow and pinched. You had to keep your right arm away from the driver so you wouldn't interfere with the steering wheel at work. And you couldn't put your feet down in this footwell without uh, crossing your ankles. So it was not a comfortable sports car, but by gosh, what a ride that was. Alan, that, that, wow. that, that <laughs> remains the single most incredible five minutes of my entire motorsports career, my ride with Peter Revson and the McLaren at Riverside. Oh my gosh, that's... Uh what people wouldn't give to have that experience. That's, that's right. That's right. Yes. And just to, to hear those uh, trumpets behind you. <laughs> yes. They, that's, that's the noise you heard. You didn't hear the exhaust so much as you heard the trumpets. It's kind of a rattling sound. Uh, I don't want to make an unpleasant noise here on the, on the video, but it was uh, like a blubbering with your tongue uh, noise. Not, uh, you knew it was powerful, but it didn't have that crack of an exhaust. It was a more flubbery sound. Uh, interesting. Interesting. Absolutely amazing. Well, that is uh, quite the stories. And if anybody wants to uh, to see those and read those stories, uh, they yes. can uh, they can pick up your books, uh, which are yes. which are phenomenal. Uh, we actually right. have one one more picture here of the uh, of the intakes, which are uh, very cool. We're blank. No, hello. it's um, sh hello. Oh, showing the uh, uh, 
the intakes. Yeah, I'm not seeing any image at all here. Uh, okay, well, we'll, okay. we'll switch right, back I, here. Alan, can you go back to one of the early slides that showed the, the range of books and the calendar that we also sell? Uh, maybe. Um, let's see if I can find that. I've got was, that was, uh, up on the screen. The sequence. Got that up on the screen now. Your video has gone blank, as uh, sometimes is wont to happen oh. um, in, in these uh, in these things. Um, okay. So uh, let's see. But I do have the uh, calendar and book images up now. Uh, we're okay, seeing yeah, the sure. Shadow, Lotus, Riverside, uh, Velocity, uh, Fast Lines, uh, Ferrari, yes. A Man and His Machines, and the complete look of uh, Lamborghini, complete book of Lamborghini. Yes, those are the six of my books. I've done a total of nineteen books today. Th those are the six that we currently have in stock and still available. Um, those those six books plus the calendar, the nineteen seventy one uh, season calendar, which is new for night for twenty twenty one. 50 year anniversary of the KM. And if the folks will go to my website, petelyons.com, we have all of those available. And they come at the normal price that people would pay elsewhere, but they get my signature. So if, oh, outstanding. If want, yes. If they want that, I'd be delighted to add it to it. Oh, that would be uh, that would be fantastic. Uh, it, you couldn't uh, couldn't do much better than that uh, to, to have a uh, signed copy. Um, and uh, the you know the the photographs are amazing. Uh, the stories, uh, like we've like we've heard, are just uh, phenomenal. And I uh, highly encourage everyone to uh, to go to uh, PeteLyons.com and uh, and pick those up. Um, Pete, we can't see you, uh, but we no. can see your books. Um, but uh, I think that is as uh, a good a sign as any that we should uh, we should wrap this up. Um, We're done. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but Pete, thank you so much for talking with us today. Um, uh, very educational, um, amazing imagery, and uh, what what a, a privilege to have been able to uh, to to you know, not only be at these, uh, these events and have these experiences, but be able to, uh, to capture them for, to share with other people. Well, Alan, it's been a delight talking with you. You know, I, I always love to talk about this stuff. It, 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 it's been my life and it just, I, I, I'm as enthusiastic about it today as I was when I was 12 years old. Well, outstanding. That you can't ask for much more than that, as to to be able to do uh, do what you want, uh, what you favor in life, and uh, be able to share it with others and still enjoy it uh, throughout your life. So, everyone, uh, please uh, go to PeteLyons.com, uh, order your favorite book or calendar there, request a uh, a signature from Pete, and um, you will have your very own signed copy of these. Uh, these fabulous books to enjoy at home. Pete, thank you once again so much for being with us today. Alan, I've enjoyed it. Thank you so much. All righty, thank you. And goodbye all. We'll uh, see you at the, uh, the next interview.